little. Oh, perfect. Thank you, folks. Okay. All right, so thank you all for being here. Uh, hello and welcome to Access Awareness Week 2023 and the Municipal Accessibility Across Nova Scotia panel discussion. Uh, thank you all so much for sharing your time uh, this afternoon to learn more about accessibility in municipalities and villages across Nova Scotia. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Holly. Um, uh, Holly McClellan, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman in my mid thirties uh, and I've got kind of medium length brown hair. Uh, I am the Municipal Accessibility Support Coordinator at the Association of Municipal Administrators of Nova Scotia. That's a mouthful. Uh, we call ourselves AMANS often. So I'll probably use AMANS again if I refer back to uh, the organization that I work for. I will be our host and moderator today uh, for the panel event. Uh, and today we will hear from three municipal accessibility leads from across the province about their municipality's accessibility plan and find out how they are moving the bar on quality of life for persons with disabilities. Uh, so kind of some quick housekeeping uh, before we get started. Uh, the access information for this webinar, uh, we will have ASL interpretation. We also have CART services. This webinar is being recorded uh, and instructions on how to access that recording will be sent via email to all attendees. Uh, also, a quick reminder for all of us uh, just to identify ourselves when we begin speaking. Our agenda for this afternoon is uh, we will do some quick introductions with the accessibility leads. We will do a land acknowledgement. I will then discuss the history of Access Awareness Week in Nova Scotia and overview of the Accessibility Act. So I'll, I'll touch on that legislation. We will then move into the panel discussion and hear from the municipal accessibility leads. Then we will take audience questions for the panelists. Uh, so we will be taking your questions. There is a Q&A box. You can pop your questions in there uh, and we will have the opportunity to answer some of those uh, near the end of this webinar. And then finally, we'll wrap things up and say goodbye for the afternoon. So we are pleased to be joined today by three municipal accessibility leads from across the province. I would like to welcome Elise Johnston, Accessibility and Inclusion Coordinator for the Region of Queen's Municipality. Elise is a Caucasian woman with light colored medium length hair. We also are joined by Melissa Myers, the Accessibility Advisor for the Halifax Regional Municipality or HRM. Moving forward, I will probably just use HRM. It's a little bit uh, easier and quicker. Uh, Melissa is a Caucasian woman with long brown hair. And finally, we have Ken Knox, who is the Municipal Development Officer and Accessibility Lead for the Town of Annapolis Royal. Ken is a Caucasian man with a beard and glasses. We acknowledge that this event is taking place in Mi'kma'ki, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq and Malasi peoples. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship. We acknowledge that all land in Canada is the traditional territory of Indigenous people. As individuals who reside in Canada, we are all treaty people and all hold the responsibility to respect and honour these laws. Uh, in a quick image description, there is a graphic of the province of Nova Scotia, uh, and that's against a blue background. We also acknowledge that people of African descent have been in Nova Scotia for over 400 years. We recognize that African Nova Scotians are a distinct founding people in Nova Scotia who have been a key part of the province's culture and history. And again, uh, that same uh, image of the province of Nova Scotia as a graphic and it's against a blue background. So um, we're going to learn a little bit about the Accessibility Act and municipal accessibility plans. So Nova Scotia's annual Access Awareness Week is about raising awareness and promoting inclusion. This year's theme is moving the bar on the quality of life. 
Nova Scotia was the first province in Canada to champion Access Awareness Week as an extension of Rick Hansen's 1987 Man in Motion World Tour. During this initiative, Rick and his team wheeled through 34 countries, raising awareness about the potential of people with disabilities and the possibility of creating accessible and inclusive communities. Since then, the work to advance equity for people with disabilities has been led by passionate, dedicated grassroots community advocates, organizations, and champions who envision a barrier-free society where attitudes, policies, and our built environment support rather than hinder full participation for all. Uh, and this image description, uh, we have a beautiful image of the 2019 Melheb Award winners. There are 10 people standing side by side and proudly holding their awards. In 2017, the foundational work of community led to Nova Scotia becoming the third province in Canada to enact accessibility legislation, which is called the Accessibility Act. The establishment of an accessibility directorate and the creation of the Access by Design 2030 strategy has brought much needed resourcing and attention to advancing the work to create a barrier-free society. Uh, and the image on the screen, we have four members of the region of Queen's Municipality Accessibility Advisory Committee standing side by side and smiling at the camera. Uh, and one of our panelists, Elise, is, is in the photo. An important piece of making Nova Scotia more accessible is being advanced by municipalities. So under the Accessibility Act, municipalities are required to create accessibility plans. All accessibility plans are required to be developed in consultation with first voice representatives who sit on the municipality's accessibility advisory committee, which is also a requirement. Accessibility plans must have information on progress made towards preventing and removing barriers, how the, excuse me, how the municipality will identify, remove, and prevent additional barriers, and how policies and programs will be assessed for their effect on accessibility. While each accessibility plan must include legislated obligations, each plan is different and reflects a range of activities and approaches to making municipalities and villages accessible. The important work outlined in these plans reflects a commitment to moving the bar on quality of life for persons with disabilities. And our image description for this slide is, again, uh, we've got the, the folks from uh, the Queen's Region um, Accessibility Advisory Committee. And I just realized that I'm not sharing my screen because I'm not, I don't have the panelists. So I'm seeing some images on my screen. You folks are not. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, you would be seeing that if, if we had the technical, uh, the technical stuff down. Um, and so perhaps what we can do uh, is I can re-record this as a video. So you folks will, will get to have those visuals as well. Uh, so just to we'll, interject, um, oh, thanks, you Jeff. are, yeah, we're not able to make you a presenter. We've mm -hmm. figured that part out. We're rolling with it. You're doing wonderfully as an audio host. So carry on. Thanks. Yeah, Thank I, I can record this and post this webinar so that folks can still have that slide deck if, if that helps. Um, I know some people like that visual aspect. All righty. Um, so through aware, excuse me, through public awareness, community partnerships, education and dialogue, Access Awareness Week aims to foster an environment of equal participation for, for persons with disabilities in Nova Scotia and believes in taking action to address some of the most pressing issues facing persons with disabilities. Now, we are going to turn it over to the Municipal Accessibility Leads to hear from them on how their municipality is working to implement their accessibility plan. All righty, folks. So I 
think for for this part, um, we will do uh, a few question and answers. I have some uh, some questions, so I will direct them um, to the accessibility leads, and we'll get to hear from them, folks. If if you have something to add or something to contribute, just jump in um, once once the person who the question is directed to has answered. So everyone will have a chance to chime in if you if you've got something you'd like to add. So our first question this afternoon is for Elise. Elise, what has your municipality done to honor the guiding principle of nothing about us without us? How are you ensuring people with disabilities are leading the conversation and work being done in Queen's municipality? Hi, thanks, Holly. Can everybody hear me? All right. Yes, we can. Sorry, we didn't see your slides that you worked hard on. <laughs> but I'm happy to start with this. Um, this really is the premise of the, the base of the act and all the plans that stem from it is this nothing about us without us. This means first voice is absolutely critical to inform the work. So I speak as an able-bodied person as much as I have um, in my family, in my friends, access to people with different experiences, I need to hear from my team, my team of advisors. So my first job coming in was compile a team. And in the act, I believe the criteria is for half your advisors to have first voice. And our municipality went with we want everybody with first voice, even if it means that you're working with an organization that supports people with disabilities, but we went with that. And I sort of had the two extremes. When I came to the job, a little delayed, spring 2020 pushed to July, I met a voicemail on my phone, a resident who was in a wheelchair, actually traveled with Rick Hansen on a basketball team. Um, he was like, call me, <laughs> I wanna be on your team. He was there before I was. So some advocates really wanted to jump on. And then on the other side, I had to solicit participation from other people. I had to get names and have conversations with them because we have to remember there's some emotional labor that goes along with self-advocacy. And in some cases, young adults haven't had a lot of experience because they've had parents advocating for themselves, or you're retired and you have spent your life struggling fighting for accessibility and you're kind of done with it. I had somebody tell me one step forward, two steps back, you know, I'm done. And I said, but we're really like asking to hear from you now. And yeah, long story short is that I now am able to learn a lot from a very diverse committee. We didn't hold a seat, you know, vision impaired, hearing impaired, mobility impaired, but it kind of worked out that way. So I've been really happy for that. Um, I could come up with a bunch of examples as how we've been learning, but I think I'll, I'll pass that on to another person as well and just really remind everybody that you can be as trained as possible. You might even have experience with disabilities yourself or in your family, but you have to keep listening to other people because it's subjective too. You know, one deaf person is not gonna say the same as another deaf person. Same thing with mobility, vision, anything. Um, just keep asking for that first voice because that is what is gonna make it meaningful in the long run. That's great. Thank you so much, Elise. Very important uh, reminder for all of us. Uh, I, I also love that you point out, you know, everyone has their own perspective. Everyone has their own life experience um, and the diversity among people is, is, is quite great. Um, and so, yeah, no, no two folks will have the same thoughts or feelings about something, um, whether they're a person with a disability or not. My next question is for Ken. Uh, Ken, in your work implementing the accessibility plan for Annapolis Royal, has anything surprised you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're a small town. We're the smallest town in Nova Scotia. Currently, we've grown to the huge size of 530 people. 
Um, and over the course of developing our plan and work, you know, our, our town budgets have been between $1 million and $2 million. So we were really daunted by the, the challenge of dealing with the built environment. And we thought this would be the hardest part. Um, but the truth is we, we found the money. Um, and almost it was easy. It was a lot of hard work with grants and different programs. But in terms of our accessibility plan, I would say that this was probably the easiest part. Um, when it comes to dealing with built environment, it's really linear, you know, this big, this wide, this high. Um, it's very visible, you know, you, you, so I think people rush to do that first. Um, and we've made some fantastic progress. You know, all of our buildings uh, are accessible, and, but they're still improving and things like this. What, what surprised me is, is the hard part was the softer side of it. Um, you know, we, we can put statements in our policies that talk about being inclusive and things like this, but that's really not an inclusive policy. Um, making true substantive changes in the policies has been harder, and that's something we continue to work on. Um, and then just dealing with the culture shift of accessibility can't be an add-on to everything we do. It, it has to be just from the beginning, it's part of everything we do. And I'd say we're getting better and better at that every day. But realizing that this free stuff, quote unquote, would be the hardest part was quite, as you say, quite a surprise for us. That's a, that's a great point, Ken. Thanks so much for sharing that. I'm sure uh, many other municipalities, towns, and villages have had that same experience um, of, of, yeah, it's that, that culture shift that really needs to happen. Um, and that might not be front of mind when everyone began this work back in 2017. All right, my next question is for Melissa. So Melissa, how many recommendations are in HRM's accessibility plan? So how like there are 30 recommendations that are lost in the HRM accessibility strategy and these recommendations follow um uh categories similar to what's in the provincial legislation so all of our recommendations are around built environment employment information and communication transportation as well as Christian services Great. And as a follow up, Melissa, to that, how is the HRM implementing your accessibility plan? HRM is quite large. We just heard from Ken, who's got about 500 folks in their community. And, and as we all know, uh, Halifax is quite large. So what's it like implementing an accessibility plan in such a big region? Um, and how are you folks doing that? Yeah, so you folks are correct. HRM is the largest municipality within Nova Scotia. So, what the accessibility strategy was approved by Regional Council in May of 2021. We quickly thought about okay, how are we going to help implement all these recommendations? So what we ended up doing was we formed what we call the Accessibility Task Force uh, Committee. So that committee is currently made up of 19 staff within HRM for a variety of business units. So we have some staff from HR, public work, transfer trains at all of those different business units. And then once the task force was developed within that task force, we then looked at what are the current recommendations that HRM needs to look on currently. And then it was decided to be what we call the subcommittee. So we currently have three subcommittees that are currently working on specific recommendations. So we have a subcommittee for inter internal built environment recommendations. We have another subcommittee for external built environment recommendations. And then we have a subcommittee 
these for employment recommendations and these subcommittees will probably be only over the course of the years, just depending on what recommendations HRM is looking for. That's great. Thank you, Melissa. Elise, as accessibility coordinator, you and, and Ken and Melissa, you folks have all become the experts in your municipality. And part of that role is to raise awareness in your workplace. Um, what success have you had with this, Elise? And can you share some specific examples of how this culture shift is happening within your municipality? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So Region of Queens sounds like an in-between of teeny tiny 500 person and HRM, which has multiple task forces. Force. Um, I at least have a dedicated role. So I have capacity uh, and there's about 30 some odd people in this single building. I'm not with public works, but I've had a great opportunity to engage with the rest of the staff. So I started with some very general training. Uh, there was a digital accessibility webinar created by Lisa Snyder specifically for municipalities, and that helped us create more screen readable documents, again, with the help of our advisors, First Voice, somebody's teaching me how to use JAWS as a screen reader. So we made sure that we had general training, and then I could go in with specific training based on your role, on your tasks, um, so information and communication officer is doing social media, make sure we have alternative text, um, somebody writing council minutes, bringing in agenda items from other organizations have to be made screen readable. So we all learned how to do a bit better at our jobs to the point where now staff will come to me and say, I have a tax form, is it screen readable? Or what about this waste schedule? Oh, should we put a QR code, all that. So, so some really great, great examples of that and where we cannot be really where we wanna be, let's say the website, for example, um, we could still improve it thanks to our first voice from the committee. Make sure that you can tab to skip to main content. You can go to the search, you can get a contact number. I offer alternative formats. I actually recorded my reading of our accessibility plan <laughs> to one of our members whose eyes was were getting tired reading, but they didn't like the robotic voice of the screen readers. So, you know, there's always alternatives. And uh, a really nice example of a culture shift is when I sent around that photo you were talking about, there's a photograph of me with a few committee members that was linked with this webinar invite. I sent that around the office more because I was chuffed at the photo and didn't corporate finance say, hey, let's have a lunch and learn. And I can tell you right now, there's about a dozen people in chamber watching this all. So everybody wave. <laughs> um, so that is, it's nice culture shift to when people start coming to you for questions and it's not always me going to them. So keep, keep working at it, it gets there. That's great. Thank you so much, Elise. Uh, and hi to all the folks tuning in from Queens. Glad to have you. Um, something that really stuck out to me, Elise, um, that I, I just love, and I, I think it's worth um, kind of shining a light on that is reading the plan to that person who didn't want to hear that robotic voice and their eyes were getting tired. That is such a great example of just what an individual kind of tailored support for a person just any person could look like, right? Um, being flexible in meeting a person's needs is it's just really wonderful. Um, I, I don't envy you in doing that. That must have taken quite a few takes, um, but uh, that that's just a really lovely example of um, kind of how to create access and support a person and, and meet their needs so that they can um, get the same information. So that that's great. Um, does anyone else kind of want to chime in on that question? Um, it, it's quite a big one, um, but kind of touching more on that cultural shift. Um, Ken or Melissa, feel free to chime in if you've got um, any kind of anecdotes or any successes or 
tips and tricks that you want to share with folks if they're maybe struggling with this in their municipality? You know, how do you get people on board or is it is it maybe still a work in progress and something that you're still uh, trying to figure out and, and make happen in your municipality? Probably I can count in if you like. I think one thing that we've been doing here with the nature, we developed a lot of what we call accessibility training. So we've received within last year alone over 75 staff so far just last year. So we're taking that training, and I think that is a good way to start to educate folks on the accessibility issues within the municipality. And also we often will do different resources that will that HIM staff will have access to. So we try when I feel things that staff might need support with, then it's like, okay, I need you now to a document to support for this or that. So we're constantly working to support staff in any way we can. That's great. Thanks for sharing, Melissa. Um, that, I, th I think too, that's a good kind of tip uh, for other municipalities or, or you know, at, any organization really is incorporating that accessibility training, that awareness raising during onboarding, right? Making sure that that's one of the kind of first introductions into your uh, your new workplace. Um, but th that's great. It's great to hear that HRM is doing that. All right, we're going to jump into our next question, uh, and this one is for you, Ken. So, as I mentioned uh, in your introduction, your main role in Annapolis Royal is Municipal Development Officer, and you kind of are Accessibility Lead on top of that. Uh, and, and as we know, many municipal employees wear many hats, uh, folks do, do many different jobs. So, I'm wondering, what was your experience with accessibility before being involved in this work? And how did you come to be the accessibility lead for your town? Uh, well, it was a little bit by, by default, certainly, as you say. Um, we're a small town, everyone's wearing a lot of hats. Here in town hall right now, besides me, there are a whopping four other people. And so, you know, that, that's how we have to deal with things. Everyone is doing a lot of things. Um, though it wasn't a job requirement, I, I think, you know, we got a little bit lucky in that my background um, was first as an educator, so I have some experience there working with diverse populations. And later I was a project manager um, building school, private schools. So I, I have um, some experience leading on our projects, but, but sort of looking at things with a more global viewpoint, making sure everyone can make use of facilities and things like that. So, so that certainly helped um, a bit, uh, but it, it, it's, I will be the first to say that on our accessibility committee, I am the weak link. Um, I, I don't, you know, as Elise was saying, I don't speak with this first voice when it comes to with these issues. And so I'm always quite willing to say, I don't know, uh, and then find an answer and, you know, help me help you kind of thing. Um, another thing about being in a small town, you know, it's a feature, not a bug that everyone kind of knows everyone else. So people do not hesitate to pick up the phone and tell me when something is wanting, or sometimes they invite me out for coffee to do it, which is very nice. Um, but, you know, we've got those informal relationships. So though I, I don't have the, res the resources that Melissa or Elise has, um, you know, we, we can have a lot of those quick casual conversations to facilitate communication um, within the town hall team. Um, also, you know, when I'm working on stuff, everybody kind of knows what it is. And when we're, you know, there's a lot of overlap between roles. And so we, we can make sure that we're, we're taking this global viewpoint when we do things, we're, we're taking everything into consideration. So that's kind of making our weakness work for us, certainly. That's great. Thanks so much, Ken. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Elise or Melissa, do either of you feel like jumping in or kind of sharing your journey of 
how how did you get here? Um, we just heard about Ken's background, which is quite varied, um, a lot of different unique experiences. Um, and I just through working with you, Elise and Melissa, um, I know you both have have a pretty uh, interesting work background as well. Do either one of you feel like kind of sharing how you got into this uh, into this role within your municipality? Sure, I'll jump in quickly. Um, I had just moved to Nova Scotia about five years ago. My background is as an architect, so the built environment was very familiar. I'm also a parent to a child with disabilities, so I had that exposure um, in terms of education, uh, behavior, different learning styles. And when I came here, that experience led me to be a job coach through employment supports, and that was for people with invisible disabilities. And then the opportunity came up thanks to the provincial support for Rick Hansen training. And that sort of pulled everything together. And it was right when the act was starting to be implemented. And thankfully, the Queen's Municipality Council decided that it was important enough to have a dedicated position. So when that job offer went out, it felt like a really nice fit. And that was, that's my story. And the rest is history. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much, Elise. That, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, and again, Melissa, I don't want to put you on the spot, uh, but if, if you, if you feel like sharing a little bit about how you came to be uh, in your role, uh, we'd love to hear it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I come from first world, um, first I realized you live with a, a disability. Um, but my, my background has been within disability studies, as well as I did previously to working for HRM, I did work for an for profit organization that supported a lot of folks with disabilities. So I did come from that background. And then when the accessibility of other positions came up, then yeah, I was fortunate to be able to take on this role. And I get that a little bit of a long time. Great, thanks, Melissa. And you're you're a social worker by trade. Am I remembering that correctly? You are correct in that. Yes, Paul. That's great. Thanks for sharing, folks. I I thought that was an interesting question because you all have such different backgrounds. You all have different educational backgrounds, different professional backgrounds, um, but you you all kind of found your way to this work. And I think that's um, that's pretty representative of. Uh, accessibility leads in municipalities across the province. Um, very, very diverse group of folks who, uh, yeah, just kind of came to this work in their own unique ways. Uh, and we're all kind of learning as we go uh, and, and connecting with each other and learning from each other. Um, so I, I thought that would be um, kind of a, a neat thing to point out for folks. Uh, we can move on to our next question. Uh, and this one is for you, Melissa. What areas will your work focus on in the coming year? Yeah, so similar to last year, because some of our recommendations are going to be recommendations that we'll be working on within the next couple of years. So, some around the environment. So what I mean by that is like we are trying to audit our buildings, our facilities, our park playground, the hill is sense of what what do we have capitalized that's accessible, what features are accessible and what features do we need to improve on for that accessibility. Um, see that HRM has hired an accessibility auditor who is currently dedicated right now to go and audit places. So with that data, we'll be able to help improve the built environment. 
I, when I look at employment, we are currently working on a workplace accommodation policy. So that policy will provide, you know, supervisors, managers, more of an understanding around the duty to accommodate. Not to think accommodate employees, but also to accommodate candidates who are applying for HR and position. Um, when I look at information communication, as I mentioned, we are really focused on delivering our training to HR and staff. I'm really excited that next month in June, we will be training police cadets on accessibility. And that's the first time that's been done in HRM. So I'm really excited with that. Um, when it comes to transportation, we have increased the number of accessible taxis. So for those of you who currently live in Niger, we have a company called Exhibio Taxi that partnered with HRM last summer. So we currently have 10 accessible Taxi will seem to increase that number as we go on. So th that just gives you an idea of the recommendation that we have is currently working to. That's great. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, lots of great things to look forward to in the coming year from HRM. My next question is for Elise. How has your municipality gotten connected into community organizations uh, and, and how has that helped drive this work forward in your municipality uh, and, and, and if you can, uh, could you give us some examples of what kind of community groups you're connecting with? Mm -hmm. This to me is sort of the fun part where I get to leave my desk and this windowless office. I get to go pound the pavement a benefit of being in this dedicated position is that I did have the time, the capacity to go out in the community. I would literally go door to door and introduce myself places like the pharmacy where people are coming to buy a seat for their bathtub. You know, do they need other resources, access to grants? I can be that resource. Uh, VON is reaching out to target audience, uh, Department of Community Services, when we looked at employability um, and recreation access, um, home support, of course, uh, residential day programs, those tend to be the elderly, but there's a lot of overlap there. I would also go to the schools. So Schools Plus is typically the resource where they're interacting with families with disabilities. So I can get connections there. Chamber of Commerce, access to the businesses. How can I help you? I can do a mini audit, help you see the priorities, link you to grants again. Um, and really trying to emphasize what can be done for free. It's not always a requirement for money. Maybe the mirror in your bathroom could come down a coat hook could come down. Is your menu screen readable? Put a QR code on it. Um, you don't have resources for a power door operator. Does customer service see the door? Do you need a doorbell? Or, you know, there's, there are other ways of addressing your, your customer base. Um, so I mentioned a bunch of them. The more I got out, the more I found people were coming back with questions. Um, we have a transit community here called QCT, Queens County Transit, and they have now six vehicles, five of which are accessible. So I've helped with some training for the drivers and I sit as a resource on their team. Um, yeah, I think just whenever there's capacity, get out into the community 
even the halls, you know, Legion Hall, a community hall. I've done some audits there, engaged with the committee members. And, and yeah, just keep reaching out to people in your community and, and let them know that you're there. That's great. Thanks so much, Elise. Uh, it, it's really great to hear uh, both in Queens and in Halifax, um, kind of that increase in accessible transportation for folks. That, that, that's exciting. That's great news. Um, I Something I also picked up on, uh, it's been a theme kind of through uh, a few of your, your discussion points is, the idea of making improvements, um, you know, and not obviously we'd like everything to be perfect and fully accessible uh, now would be ideal, but right, like like making improvements and striving for those improvements um, is is really great to hear that um, you know we're not waiting around for things to be absolutely perfect. If you can make an improvement in the meantime, make the improvement. Um, I, I, I that's really poignant to me. Uh, our next question, um, this one, uh, I'm going to throw it back to you, Melissa. Um, you shared a lot of great stuff that, that you're up to in, uh, in the next year. I'm wondering what your plans are to continue community engagement in this coming year. If you could touch on that for us. Yeah, so I can touch on a couple things. So one thing, like, with all the municipalities is that we do have an accessibility advisory committee. So I really encourage we always advertise when folks are coming up. Um so keep on one folks. Also within that um advisory committee on an annual basis we do what we call it the town hall that normally takes place in the fall. So that allows people within a term to come. We're so concerned we have staff members from various business units who come to that uh, town hall meeting to address those concerns. And as well those concerns help me to look at the strategy because we are trying to implement it. There was strategy in 2001. This year, we are trying to focus on going back up to communities, what we're hoping to do, to heal from community on how are we doing, are the current recommendations still what communities are looking for, because next year will be three years since the strategy has been implemented. So in 2024, our plan is to update um, the strategy based on what we hear from provincial legislation standards, based on what we hear from community, and also looking at what we hear internally. So hoping to do some engagement as well with staff internally to help. Uh, with the update of this project. Busy year ahead for you, Melissa, is what is what it sounds like. Uh, that that's great. Thank you for sharing. Ken, I have a question for you. Um, how can citizens get involved in the work municipalities and villages are doing to increase access and improve quality of life for disabilities? So if I'm a person who lives in Annapolis Royal, um, how can folks get involved in the work being done? People just usually yell at me on the street. Uh, so um, I go out twice a day and I'm, I'm visiting you know, the town and things like walking up and down the street. Um, so people do stop me on the street. And I think this doesn't have to be a small town thing. Uh, informally reaching out to an accessibility leave is possible for anybody if you have a concern or if you want to learn how you can help or if you just want to learn more. Um, but certainly, as I mentioned earlier, I, I get my fair share of calls and things like this. A couple months ago, someone came into town hall uh, concerned with benches. Um, we have lots of benches downtown, but like on our trails and things like that, there aren't as many benches. And this person was wondering what we could do about it. And he had gone to the trouble of mapping where all the benches were within the municipality. 
And so then this set me off on an investigation of number one, okay, we're looking at those, but then what are the standards for benches? And there's a UN standard of, you know, between 100 and 200 meters per benches. So we settled on 150. And now one of the things our committee is dealing with is making sure our benches are spread out enough so there's no more than 150 meters between benches on any given path. Um, so, you know, just don't wait for the opportunity, you know, create the opportunity is certainly, I would think, the best way. Um, but, you know, for us to, we're much better about, it used to be if we were doing a capital project or something, we would put out a call for input and ask if anyone was interested in being on said committee. That might have been fine in the past, but not really. But now um, we're much better about getting diverse viewpoints. Um, we recently started redesigning a playground because it was getting old and a bit worn. Um, so we put out the same calls before, but then this is through our active living coordinator. He also approached our accessibility committee and asked for a volunteer to sit on the design committee. So these viewpoints are taken into account as well. Um, so simply relying on people to speak up to make their needs known, it's not enough. It was probably never enough, but we certainly we know better now. And so we have to do different now. And, and so seeking out those voices and kind of encouraging them to be a part of it um, is, is something we're much better at now. Thanks, Ken. Um, Melissa kind of just touched on this as well, that they've got uh, community engagement happening this year. So folks who live in the HRM can get involved that way. Um, Elise, is there, there any kind of special way uh, that folks can get connected if they live in Queens um, or any, yeah, any kind of advice or uh, anecdotes like, like Ken mentioned. I love that someone just said, hey, the benches aren't working. Um, and then you folks can actually do that work. That, that's such a great example of how um, citizens can, can get involved and make positive change. I, I just love that story. Well, really it's, Call the municipality, ask for me, or say you have an accessibility point to make and they will get the message to me. I've received messages through the online forms, uh, even Facebook Messenger, uh, I've had questions. So yeah, everybody can just look up their municipality and ask for the contact. That's great, thanks. And so this is um, kind of returning back to a question that I that I asked Melissa, but I'll I'll throw this out there to uh, to you, Ken and Elise as well. If if there's anything that you folks want to share, um, you know, what does your work look like in the coming year? Do you have any projects that you're excited about or you'd like to share? Uh, I'll I'll simply say that for us, yeah, you know, I mentioned that you know I. I discovered or I found out that, you know, culture is the harder part to shift. I mean, we had some, we've had some good wins with regard to built environment. Um, and I think, you know, it would be very easy for us to get complacent and say, look at what we've done. We've got X, Y, and Z. Um, but it, it's keeping the work of the committee moving forward, you know, benches, things like this that, that we didn't think of necessarily, that, that didn't show up on any of our inventories, you know, distance between benches. Um, so it, it's staying hungry for making things better for everybody in, in the town um, is certainly, I think, is, is my number one goal. If I feel like we're, that things have slowed down and are manageable, then I probably have missed something and, and need to change what I'm doing. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, I, I tend to echo those sentiments. It's easy to have a lot of grant money on the table, um, harder to have labor capacity. Public works is really stretched, many projects on the table. Um, but yeah, I'm more curious and passionate about, you know, supported employment and other opportunities, independent living. So we do have some partnerships with social enterprise and that kind of thing. Um, just one point I'd like to make here when I talk about the grants, again, a plug for every municipality to have a dedicated position to spend time writing for grants. The provincial community and business accessibility grants are, are excellent. That is, that's one slice. But to go to federal, Enabling Access Fund has been very generous. 
Um, even the new horizons for seniors, that could be money for programming, that could be money for built environment. A uh, community hall got a ramp put in and now they're doing programming. You can always have transportation budget written into those. But also looking outside of the accessibility grants, you can write to community health board grants for programming. I got some mini ellipticals for people with mobility issues. You could exercise at home in your chair and I drive those around to people. Um, there's also equipment loans programs coming out of Sport Nova Scotia or Recreation Nova Scotia. We're getting an adapted trike. Um, what else? Even community facilities. We've, we've seen the curling club has got a new power door and a ramp. They're really so many supports out there and it takes a little bit of time. So if it's on the side of somebody's desk, it may not get addressed. Um, so yeah, I really encourage all the municipalities to <laughs> write for grants and not just the built environment ones. Yeah. That's great advice. Thanks, Elise. Yeah, it's um, the capacity is always, uh, always something that, you know, a lot of us in our workplaces um, that's always an issue. Uh, you know, there's lots of great things to do, but yeah, human resources is always, uh, always can be an issue. So I, I love that advice of, um, you know, there are lots of grants out there, um, but yeah, taking the time to write them is, is another thing. But uh, for those folks who are, yeah, wondering how, how can you make accessibility projects happen? Um, there is funding if you do a little bit digging. And e Elise, I don't want to speak, for, speak for you, but if there are other, um, folks working in municipalities who maybe didn't have time to write down some of those grants that you mentioned, um, maybe we can, can put them in contact with you or they can look you up on the Queen's um, website and, and maybe you can give them uh, just some quick info on some of the grants that are out there. That's great, thank you. Before you, I don't want to interrupt the conversation, oh, Holly. Jump in, Please Jeff, carry on. No, I'm just going to prompt folks in the audience if they have questions to drop them into the Q&A uh, form and we can begin shortly uh, facilitating those with the panelists, but please uh, carry on. Don't you read my mind, Jeff? That was what I was just <laughs> I was just going to jump into that. I was going to uh, just let the panelists know, you know, if there's anything else you want to share, uh, feel free. Otherwise, we will move into audience questions uh, at this point. So uh, I'm just going to give a pause. And if anyone has anything else they want to want to add, feel free. And then otherwise, we'll jump to audience questions with I'm, I'm very excited for. <laughs> Uh, one take... question. Oh, go one, ahead, Jeff. One... Thanks. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, one question would be, as a, a resident of a municipality, what would be one thing that I could do to raise awareness in my community of some of the issues that you're working on? It's not directed at any in particular person. My suggestion, if it was somebody in my county reaching out to me, I would be encouraging you to, depending on your capacity and your comfort level, but almost arrange mini training sessions or mini audits. Like if you're involved in an organization, maybe it's a sports group or, you know, something at the library. Uh, maybe you play bingo at the Legion. I don't know. Um, but starting the conversations in your circles and then broadening those to peer groups, reaching out to your community hall, and hopefully you can get support from your municipal coordinator uh, if, if that person exists. Um, but yeah, it starts with reaching out and, and asking because there should be an advisory committee and you could be an extension of that. We don't have to hold a seat to get somebody's involvement for sure. And Elise, uh, just for those uh, folks who are tuned in who might not um, might not be aware or have a good understanding of what an audit is, like, could you explain what that what that could look like to have uh, a mini audit in, um, you know, a, a community group or what have you, whatever the person was in? Yes. So, as Ken mentioned, the built environment it's super tangible. 
you can take the tape measure, you can measure, you can see, does a wheelchair fit here? Is there a visual alarm? Is the lever, is the handle a lever? Um, there are checklists uh, of varying thoroughness. I mean, Rick Hansen is super, super dense and excellent when you're starting from scratch. But, you know, are we going to change all the outlets in every building? Probably not. Um, so I try to prioritize. Can you get in the building? Can you access a washroom? Then we're looking at other supports to hearing, to visual, to wayfinding. Um, there was a provincial tool, I believe it's still in the directorate's website, and we talked about AMANS maybe having one. It can, it can be summarized, priority, what to look at. Um, that would be an audit for a physical building. Great, thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I know uh, for some of us in this work, we're really familiar with uh, all yeah. of the language all of the time, but um, yeah, for some folks who maybe weren't as familiar with what that means uh, and were thinking of, of dollars <laughs> and finances. That's great, thanks. Um, Got a, another question here, Holly. Oh, thanks, go ahead, Jeff. Um, with the emergencies in Nova Scotia currently, are there any increased planning for evacuations of persons with disabilities who may not have friends or family nearby? And I think the question submitter is obviously referring to the wildfires that are going on, but this was also an issue that cropped up uh, during Fiona as well. Um, so I, again, not directed at anyone in particular, but if anybody wants to jump on that one. Uh, certainly I can speak to our resources here in our, our municipality. Um, we've been, and this started with Dorian to a certain extent and then Fiona later, we, though we weren't affected as much by Fiona. Um, our comfort centers now are, are all accessible. And so we try to take this into account as well for something to qualify as a comfort center you know, it is you know, ingress and egress possible and can we account for other things so that they are fully accessible. Um, so uh, now we, we don't have the ability to move people but you know, every chance we get to make a different community asset accessible, we're certainly taking that. Yes, and I'm happy to say that things have moved in that direction post Fiona. Um, we did see there was going to be an act for a vulnerable person's registry at the provincial level. That was actually shelved because it makes more sense to be at the municipal level with our EMO, our emergency management um, organizations that have fire and police uh, senior safety. And ours now has partnered with the transportation with these five accessible vans. And I was just at a seniors expo and I see that our, it's just still on my desk. Um, it's a voluntary registry. It's Queens County registry for emergencies and extreme weather events. It's led by the RCMP senior safety coordinator and partnered with EMO. So each individual will decide if they want to be on this, first of all, I'm trying to manage expectations too. Um, and, and the registry will hold information like whether there is family nearby with vehicles, um, whether this person needs oxygen, uh, what kind of mobility issues are they hearing? Do they need ASL? Um, so I'm very happy to see that this is starting here and I think it will be happening province-wide to look at a registry and make sure that everybody knows what you need. Um, thank you both. I just wanna note a comment here from Dawn Stegan, Executive Director of the Accessibility Directorate. She's noted that the interim guidelines for outdoor and indoor spaces have been temporarily removed from the Accessibility Directorate's website as they're being updated and additions being made and amendments to that document uh, it should be up in the fall, a revised version of that uh, resource. If anybody would request or is looking to request a copy in the meantime, they can send an email to accessibility at novascotia.ca. I'll also plug uh, Sherry Costa with uh, the Nova Scotia League for Equal Opportunity has uh, wisely promoted the resources available on the Access Awareness Nova Scotia website. 
And just go back to Melissa there. You've got your hand up. Melissa, were you wanting to speak to the last question around uh, emergency planning? Yeah, thanks, Kara. So similar to what we, we are looking at the vulnerable registry as well within each of you. Oh, I know some of our old conflict centers, I know EMO has already been thinking long well before the unfortunate work, wildfires. But long before that, we've been kind of in the early stage of looking at how accessible are our conference centers. And I think one thing to really highlight here is I think transportation is going to be a huge component to this. So we were fortunate that. I had heard that extra care test over the weekend was helping people uh, evacuate the home. So that was really great to heal. But I think like on a bigger scale, as we think about comfort centers, we need to think about how are we transporting people from A to B. And also within those comfort centers, what I have in the resources and support there for for individuals that might need support while staying in those uh, comfort centers as well. So I think this will be a further conversation, yeah, um, as we go along in the next little while. Back to you, Holly. There's not currently any other questions in the queue. I would encourage folks that if they do come upon additional questions afterwards and they wish they had answered or asked them, they could visit the Access Awareness Week Nova Scotia website at aawns.ca and submit a question there and we could route it to the appropriate person. I, I was also going to add, um, this isn't affiliated with, with me or with this panel event, but I do know that there, um, there is a webinar happening this Friday, so June 2nd, um, by the uh, McCacken Institute for Public Policy and Governance, uh, so through Dalhousie. Um, and this webinar is actually uh, titled After Popular Attention Washes Away, and it's a check, check in post Fiona. Um, and so again very very topical right now um it's it's kind of touching on um you know how do we ensure programs and services are accessible uh for people with disabilities um yeah and, and what does that um, kind of emergency response look like um so just just because it came up um i, I will kind of uh let folks know that that is happening um you could probably find that on on google uh, or on the dalhousie website um and again, it's called After Popular Attention Washes Away, check in post Fiona. Uh, so some of those speakers might be able to talk um, kind of even maybe on a broader uh, level on, on what's happening in the province right now. I, I will kind of pause and, and give some space for folks to type in some more questions if you have them. Um, so it can be uh, kind of in general or directed towards one of the panelists. Hi, Amanda here. Just to note on the um, webinar that Holly was discussing, it is also listed on Access Awareness Week website. So if you go to www.aawns.ca, it will go to events. It's also listed as a community event. Thanks, That's Amanda. Great. Thanks, Amanda. No, no other questions coming from the audience just now, Holly. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, all right, folks. Uh, if if you don't have any questions um, for us. That's all right. Uh, maybe maybe when this is over, some questions will come into your mind. Um, so if you want to know what your municipality or village is doing to make their programs, services, and policies more accessible, um, the Accessibility Act requires that all accessibility plans are publicly available. Um, and so most municipalities and villages have their accessibility plan on their website. 
uh, some municipalities uh, have collaborated and they have a regional plan. Um, and so if, if you want to check out what commitments your municipality has made, um, you can visit their website or again, just jump on Google, uh, type in the name of your municipality and the, the term accessibility plan, and you should be able uh, to find it. If that, if that option doesn't work for you, you can just email or call your municipality and request a copy of their accessibility plan. Uh, and many will provide the plan in alternative formats as well. Um, and something kind of new and exciting, uh, you can also visit the Association of Municipal Administrators Municipal Accessibility Support Program website. So that is the, the website for, for my program. Um, and this website will be soft launched on Friday, uh, so at the end of the week. Uh, and this website houses all municipal accessibility plans from across the province. Um, so you can, you can go there, you can check out uh, the plan for your municipality, or maybe you wanna kind of compare and, and take a look at what's happening across the province. You can do that as well. A link to the website will be circulated via email to all attendees um, of this webinar, and that will happen later this week on Friday. Uh, so if you want to check that out, you can. Uh, this website, kind of calling it beta testing. So if you have feedback, uh, feel free to, to email me. Uh, my contact info will be on that website, or you can reach me at H-M-A-C-L-E-L-L-A-N at amans.ca. And I'm just gonna quickly check in with Jeff. No, no, no last minute questions from the audience. No, just a few thank yous to everybody for uh, the very informative discussion. We had a few thank yous, no questions though. Okay, great. Well, thank, thank you all. <laughs> thank you all for coming out this afternoon to spend time with us to learn more about accessibility in municipalities across the province. Um, also, also a big thank you to folks who came out. Um, we know there's a lot happening in the province right now with the wildfires. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just a scary time and a really difficult time for a lot of people in our communities. Um, so thank you for being here with us. To learn more about other Access Awareness Week events happening across the province this week, you can visit the Access Awareness Week website, uh, and that website is www.aawns.ca. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful Access Awareness Week. And thank you to our panelists. My goodness, thank you, the three of you, for coming out. Uh, it was wonderful hearing what's going on in your municipalities. Uh, and best of luck in the work moving forward. It sounds like you're all doing great work to increase access in your communities. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.